You know, Charlotte, I feel like we were spoiled in 2023 with a lot of great games. So I thought it'd be a cool, a cool idea if we sort of looked at some of the games and the stories that we think might have gotten kind of like overshadowed or sort of overlooked in all the hoopla of 2023 with all the really big like AAA games like Spider-Man and Alan Wake and um, Baldur's Gate and all those kind of big titles. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely excited to hear what you think was overlooked in 2023 because I definitely feel like I have fallen for the glitz of like playing a lot of AAA games. So I definitely am always on the hunt for good smaller games. Yeah, I think especially for me, games that came out in the beginning part of the year too, when I was kind of going back into my backlog, there were there were definitely a lot of games that I that I really enjoyed story-wise that that I think kind of got overshadowed later in the year. So yeah, did you want to start with uh, one of your games? Yeah, I mean, I know one of my games is a game that we both played and enjoyed and it was Oxen 3 2. Oh, yeah. Which released in the summer of 2023. And I don't know how long it's been since you played the first game. It, it was a while. Because um, I think, what did it come out, like four years ago, something like that? It uh. came out in 2016. Oh, my. Wow, <laughs> that long ago? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, that's that's terrifying. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't know if I actually played it when it first came out, though, to be honest. Maybe that's why it feels like it was more recent. Yeah, I played it in 2017. So okay, it's, been yeah. a, it's been a hot minute for yeah. me. But it was definitely... It's really impressive in a game like that where you can jump into it and be like, oh, I remember, like, this world. I remember this gameplay. Yeah. Like, they did such a good job of, like, it's a new adventure, but it still has the same feeling that you loved in the first game. Yeah, it has a very unique DNA. The the art style, the sort of perspective, too, with the really small characters and that kind of, like, painterly sort of map. Um, And, of course, like, the radio kind of dial gameplay. I did have to go back and watch some YouTube recaps of the first one because I did forget. I, I like I kind of remembered the tone of the story, but there's a few plot details, specifically like in the lore, that I had to kind of catch up on. And I'm glad I did because I, I do like the lore in those games. I know a lot of people have had like conflicting views on whether they kind of liked the approach of the first game as, you know, being a group of teenagers versus the second game being, you know, people in their 30s. Did you find that you related more to these characters? Did you find that you <laughs> liked them more? Um, I I probably did relate more towards the Oxen Free 2 characters a little bit, um, specifically like Jacob, because he's kind of like a bumbling kind of clown, <laughs> which I, would, I, I can relate very Jonathan, much to. Jonathan, do not look up <laughs> internet people's opinion of Jacob. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I did really like... I mean, I think one of the reasons why the first one really resonated with me, because I I like the kind of like traditional teen horror kind of setup, but it does go into, and it kind of explores areas that you wouldn't really expect, which I really liked about. It's like kind of like, you know, like trauma and and like, you know, how things like that kind of shape your life and like feelings of regret and remorse and things like that. But I think they they did keep that theme with this one as well. Um, It's just like you said, with with older characters. So it kind of hits a little bit differently. Um, but I, I just love like the type of storytelling where you know you're intermingling like kind of like hallucinatory flashback that flashbacks uh, here and there, and it and I just really loved like the kind of radio wave parallel dimension type of mood there that's going on with it. I think that's really cool. And it's also a really interesting narrative because like obviously all games you know have dialogue and most of the time nowadays voice dialogue, but it's a game yeah. that like relies so much on kind of a constant dialogue between the characters and not just that but it's kind of like the you are experiencing the same passage of time that the characters are which is always like an interesting thing to try and pull off in a narrative yeah definitely i actually felt a lot of firewatch vibes too especially with like how you can always call um your radio and and talk to your supervisor and all the climbing and just kind of like the rhythm of the game how you know if you find something new you can kind of get opinions from different people not spoiling the exact end decision of the game in case you haven't checked it out yet but did you have trouble making that last choice (laughs) yes since it relies so heavily on the choices that you make and a lot of times the choices they kind of like pop up casually too so you're you're not always like prepared that it's going to have like this heavy consequence um so yeah i did find myself like hesitating a lot (laughs) (laughs) i think we might have talked about this 
a while ago. I don't know if it was Oxen Free, but it might have been another game. It might have been one of the Lost Podcast episodes, <laughs> the One Lost Podcast episode. Um, but I feel like you were when you were t- were you um, relating this to like Blake Crouch, like the Wayward Pines series. Was that something you were doing? Uh, or maybe it was a different. game. I think it was a different game, but oh, okay. it definitely does still have that energy. And I mean, anytime there's you know like weird dimensional time travel sort of thing yeah. that definitely makes me go oh Blake Crouch yeah and I think I've also mentioned this before of other games but it does have you know kind of that like beautiful tragedy feeling that like Celesting touches on a lot oh uh, yeah it definitely reminded me of even though this was older characters it still sort of had that kind of teen mystery vibe like a cozy mystery vibe to it yeah, there definitely was a moment where I'm kind of like, wait, how old are these characters again? <laughs> yeah, and part of that might be just like the look of the game too, since they're so tiny yeah. and cute looking. Everybody <laughs> looks like a little toy. <laughs> but yeah, it made me think a little bit about um, like books like uh, We Were Liars by E. Lockhart um, and those kind of like teen mystery horror slash books <laughs> um, and also uh, Holly Jackson, some of her books. And I heard someone uh, recommend this on TikTok uh, it was Saturday Night Ghost Club. What are you by doing? Craig Davidson. On... <laughs> that was a good recommendation because I think that's about like teenagers exploring the paranormal. Yeah, that actually is a very nice read. <laughs> oh yeah, you liked it. Yeah. Oh nice. What are you doing on TikTok? <laughs> I was looking for books that uh, <laughs> reminded people of Oxenfree. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that you definitely have a good number of games on your list that I actually have not played so i would love to hear some about them one that um kind of surprised me it's it's a very interesting game it's called slay the princess yeah i've definitely like heard that mentioned a lot but i haven't delved into what it is exactly yeah i think it's starting to get a little bit more attention now but it's a very interesting game it's i would basically describe it as um like a horror adventure game so it's very much relied on you know, the choices that you make. And it's a really cool looking game because it's, it's basically like a first person perspective, but it's all sort of pencil drawn art uh, that's really subtly animated in different ways, but it's very, very beautiful and like evocative at times. And it's really cool because it like, it starts out, you're, you're alone in the woods and you have this narrator that's sort of instructing you. And it's cool because it, it ta- this, this game, it takes a very interesting approach to like the unreliable narrator in general. Um, because in this game, the narrator, he's not only like describing what's happening, he's also like encouraging you and trying to influence you to do things and persuade you in different ways, uh, which is really cool. So it starts out, you're alone in the woods and the narrator is just telling you that, okay, you have to, you're gonna have to go to this cabin and there's a princess in there and you have to kill her to save the world. And that's like kind of like the setup. And then from there, you know, you're given all these different options. Like you can go in, you can you can ask questions to the narrator. You can kind of you can kind of question the whole premise of the game. And every time you do that, you know, the narrator will respond and he'll be like, no, 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 you know, don't do that. Or he'll, if you agree with him, he'll be like, yes, yes, keep going. Uh, and it's it's fully voiced too, so it has that very interactive feel. Um, but yeah, what I love about it is that it it really dissects kind of storytelling, just like the storytelling process, and a lot of you know, common themes in storytelling, like the hero's journey and like going to the going into the belly of the beast and that kind of stuff. And what I love about it is there's I mean, I don't want to spoil too much, but it's the game kind of like works in like mini cycles in a way. And every time you kind of go through a cycle, you sort of depending on the choices that you made, you take on or like acquire another persona. I guess is the way to put it. And what that means is that the next time you kind of go through a cycle, you have like another voice and they're also like trying to convince you on like the path that you take. And then they'll be like bickering with the narrator too. And it's, it's really funny. So like a few examples is like, there's like the voice of um, the hero. There's another one called like the voice of the broken. And they all have like very specific characteristics that kind of work to Put you down a particular path kind of reminded me a little bit of disco elysium in that yeah, way. i was gonna say yeah not like exactly the same but like that kind of dynamic and um yeah i just love the idea of like you in a like a conventional fairy tale and then you're like arguing with the narrator and trying to like figure out what the point of everything is so yeah definitely highly recommend it anything where you're interested in like the craft of storytelling and like really um subversing like tropes and conventional storytelling techniques i think like anybody interested in that would love this yeah and i feel like especially with there are so many games now where it's like oh your choices do matter much more than 
they used to back in the day when games were like your choices matter like i would really love to talk to more like developers about you know how they're structuring that how are they plotting that out like how are they you know accommodating for all these choices while also you know directing the player to do things that they need to do yeah this game in particular i feel like you know, whatever kind of flow chart they had to map out all your choices must have been insane. Because it, it see, honestly, it does feel like it's endless, the, the <laughs> amount of possibilities. Because it's not like, oh, go here, go there. You, you literally, like, will have, like, 10 sometimes, like, different paths. And each one, it's not like that fake choice where you pick one and you just get, like, some dialogue. This one, as soon as you pick something, like, you're going in a direction, <laughs> uh, which, I, which I definitely dig. Yeah, so again, if you really like anything that really... Um, sort of dissects the storytelling process. It, it definitely reminded me of, of like books that do that as well. Um, if you've ever read like The Orphan's Tales by um, Catherine M. Vellante, that's one that really sort of deconstructs storytelling. I keep saying that, I don't know why I said it like five times. Deconstruction. <laughs> but it's, it's sort of like that Arabian Nights style of storytelling where you have like stories within stories within stories. I, I really like that kind of stuff because it sort of calls into question like how important storytelling is just in our like society and how it's developed throughout the years. I know you're not a big graphic novel person, but you gotta read Sandman. Commenters know, agree yeah. with me. He has to read Sandman. I know I'm pretty bad with. I think I've only read like that graphic novel, the <laughs> cyberpunk one. Um, and it's not because I don't like graphic novels. I just I don't know for some reason I just have like a really big blind spot and I've never gotten around to it. But yeah, Sandman is on my list. Everyone tells me that's amazing. So and I, I like Neil Gaiman. Like I've heard him speak a lot. It seems like a cool dude. Oh, you mean that one time we went to film an event and Neil Gaiman just showed up? Yeah, he just up. popped up one time. <laughs> yeah. No, he's very, seems like a very interesting guy, so I, I definitely need to read up. Read up on him. <laughs> yeah, so controversial question for you. Uh -oh. Do you think, as we're talking about, like, underappreciated games, and this one obviously got lots of attention, mm. but I know it was kind of ignored in awards and didn't Ooh. really get anything. Do you think people appreciated Final Fantasy XVI for all that it offered? This is a big can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This, I feel like we need a whole podcast to talk about Final Fantasy XVI because I think overall I was very pleased with the game, specifically the story, too. I thought like the story was, was very good. I, I think they did a really good job of making compelling characters that can kind of carry the story throughout the whole tale. Um, there's definitely some things I did not like about it, but overall... I definitely think it was like on the higher echelon of like Final Fantasy games. If we want to look at like the whole history of the mainline games, do you think it deserved more award recognition than it got? It got nominated for best RPG, right? For game of the uh, for the Game Awards, and it must I, have been right. I believe it was also under best narrative. Okay, I, mean, I think that's solid. See, to me, this is this is what I mean. Like this kind of opens up, opens up a whole thing because. My big thing with like the game of the year was I don't think remakes should be considered for game of the year awards or really any of those like high awards just because I feel like it's almost like in the Oscars where you have, you know, original screenplay and adaptive adapted screenplay. I feel like you should have a separate category for remakes. Cuz there were a lot of good remakes this year. You had like Dead Space, you had Resident Evil uh, 4. There might have been a few other ones that I'm forgetting. I would have definitely taken out uh, Resident Evil from the Game of the Year conversation. I don't know if I would have put in Final Fantasy sixteen. Uh, Hi-Fi Rush is pretty cool. Um, I mean, we're kind of like going off on a <laughs> tangent, I know. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think on any other year, pro probably Final Fantasy sixteen would have gotten a lot more love and attention. Maybe that's kind of like what you're getting at. Um, but I don't think the fact that it wasn't considered for awards uh, like diminishes how good the game was. I yeah. thought it was a great game. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have my own host of problems with yeah. the narrative that Final Fantasy XVI presented. I still overall enjoyed it, but that is definitely something that we want to delve deeper into in the future. <laughs> yeah, we should definitely do like a full-on Final Fantasy XVI episode because there's just so much. I mean, I definitely have like a few quibbles, more than a few quibbles, but um, <laughs> I still think like the overall, like what they were able to achieve um, it should be commended because it is a pretty complex plot and they definitely explore a lot of interesting themes that are kind of hard to do in games and I thought for the most part they did a pretty solid job. Another game that we both played and definitely got like a little bit of like award nudge at it but I feel like in the general population was kind of you know not super talked about 
maybe not super played was Lies of P. Mm, yeah, that's another good one. Which I will say I am quite often not a Souls like gamer. Like, I have played a little bit of Bloodborne. I have just recently started playing the Elden Ring multiplayer like mod on PC with my friends, but that's kind of a different experience than, you know, just <laughs> straight up Elden Ring. But this one definitely, I think, drew me in a bit because, one, it's a little bit ridiculous, and I find that <laughs> incredibly enjoyable. <laughs> but also just I feel like a lot of, you know, the souls like are kind of a little less like the narrative is, you know, right there and like kind of presented to you. It's a little more like, oh, you have to dig through like journals and whatnot to kind yeah. of piece that together, which I think works great for those games. But I definitely am kind of intrigued by the idea of, you know, a souls like that is also kind of giving you a more like presented to you narrative story. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think one of the things that Liza P does well is it. I mean, it does still borrow a lot from the like the Dark Souls storytelling thing, where you know a lot of the lore is in item descriptions and kind of like uh, I guess like nebulous dialogue from like NB NPCs here and there. <laughs> but as you said, there is like a very clear beginning, middle, and end. You know, you are going through a journey. There's like there's points that you get to in the story where like things happen and then that kind of like leads you to go to other places. You're not just sort of like exploring like this big area and just like trying to piece everything together yourself. They, they do like kind of lead you on a little bit, which I think works well for the type of story that they're telling. And also like the game is not incredibly like gigantic. It is somewhat focused, which I do like. And every time you go into a new area, there's like a specific narrative reason for that. You're not just kind of like stumbling in like this giant castle and trying to figure out like, oh, this king killed all his wives. Why did he do that kind of thing? I got to look at all these paintings, which I love, by the way. I'm not knocking that. Um, but it's just I think it, it's cool to like see us like a different uh, kind of take on the Soulsborne storytelling approach. And here is a question for you. What is your feeling when fighting, you know, like a end of level boss in a game like Lies of P. Do you do it solo or do you use the specters ever? Uh, I, um, it uh, completely depends on if I am having fun fighting the boss. <laughs> like I usually always try the first time by myself and like, I don't mind, you know, trying to beat a boss for like an hour or two, as long as it's like a fun fight. But if it's just like an annoying fight or I feel like it's a little cheap, then I'll, I'll summon it just because I want to get past it. Yeah, definitely same for me. And also, like, that is kind of a way that sometimes the narrative works against mm, a yeah. game like this because, like, yeah, you want to, like, work through the boss because that's kind of why you're playing the game for, like, that kind of hard gameplay yeah. element. But when you're like, oh, I want to keep pursuing this yeah. story, <laughs> you're like, oh, let me, that is true. Yeah, let me just get through yeah. this quicker. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, the more humanoid type enemies I found a little bit more frustrating than like the really big robot puppets. Um, but yeah, there are some really cool boss fights. I, I love when you sort of get to a point in the game where some of the enemies aren't puppets. I don't know if you've gotten to that point, but that, that, that kind of like adds a new element to the game that I think is pretty cool. But yeah, I think when, we, when people talk about Lies of P or any kind of Soulsborne-like game, they focus on the action adventure aspect of it but I think this game like it does have a really cool story it's not just the whole Pinocchio setting like the actual things that happen I think are actually really cool and I love the way it sort of um, it kind of like echoes a lot of the concerns about like the industrial revolution and how you know it took over like people's jobs and sort of the perils of unchecked greed and ambition I, I like a lot of those sort of ideas that I think this kind of explores in interesting ways also, shout out to whoever on like the writing creative team was like, okay, so Jiminy Cricket is a copyrighted name by <laughs> Disney. You mean Gemini Cricket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shout out to whoever was like, I have an idea. Yeah. And Let's shout out to whoever came up with the term P organ. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I do like how some of the obviously nods to the original fairy tale are, are like, direct but then some of them are a little bit more obtuse and some of them i didn't even really like put together my myself i had to look like watch a youtube video to to figure out 
Um, I That's the like, kind of in-depth analysis you won't get from us. Yes. I don't know. I, yeah, I guess you can call it like a subgenre. Of this, um, I don't know, maybe you call it like a retelling of classic fairy tales or like a reimagining. Um, but I think that definitely works well for games. And I do like the kind of perverse juxtaposition of what at least a lot of like people like me who grew up with a lot of the Disney uh, iterations of these stories. It's funny to like counterpoint that with a horror game or like a really like graphic bloody action adventure RPG. And it is also fun seeing like obviously games have done this in the past with like you know the twisted take on a fairy tale. Yeah. But it's fun seeing that continue to be explored because that's also such a big like current interest in especially YA literature and I just know like there's so many like Naomi Novak comes to mind. She has some really great like Spinning Silver uprooted like it's always, I feel like you can also tell a lot about a creative person when they, you know, write a story inspired by another narrative, but change it in a way that makes it more interesting to them because that's like, it's very clear what interests them about that story they're choosing. Yeah, I was um, reading up a little bit about um, another book like that. It's called The Bloody Chamber by uh, Angela Carter. And that one's a collection of stories that you can describe as sort of all takes on traditional fairy tales. Like, like I know there's one based on Sleeping Beauty. There's another one based on Little Red Riding Hood. Um, but it was cool because she actually rejected the idea that they're like adult versions of these kind of like child fantasies. She, she sort of described them as like uh, like unearthing the latent like core ideas of these stories, of the original stories. And I thought that was just like a cool idea. It's like these these ideas were already there. It's just that like they were kind of like in the subtext and she's sort of like bringing them out. Yeah, especially like you also see a lot of authors, you know, kind of going back to like their heritage Mm, and rewriting, you know, kind of the pop culture version into more related to their culture. Like Jen Rose Nethercott does a really good job of that in her works. Oh, nice. Yeah, it also made me think about just a lot of these old fairy tales, they are like the original versions are pretty dark and horrible or scary. Like the original uh, Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen, that one's like super dark and a little disturbing. Um, nothing like the Disney version. And uh, and of course, like Grim Tales, like those yeah. are no secret. Grim furries. <laughs> yeah. So one, I, I really like science fiction stories, especially when they deal with space exploration. And there is one game that came out earlier in the year. It's called Deliver Us. Mars. And it's actually a sequel to a game called Deliver Us the Moon, which I don't know. Are we exactly. just slowly traveling? <laughs> <laughs> Next one's Deliver Us Jupiter. No. Um, but yeah, it's just um, what I love about the original and this one. It's like, I'll give you like a quick synopsis. Basically, it's um, like Earth is being depleted of its resources, and, you know, there's like an energy crisis. And, you know, we're running out of food and water and all these kinds of things. So there's a uh, there's like a scientific endeavor to like farm energy on the moon and I guess the premise is sort of like wirelessly transmitting energy via these like giant satellite relays Um, and that's kind of like what the first one's about but then eventually uh, mankind they sort of like abandon or at least the side there's like a scientific group of people that sort of abandon um, saving earth and they decide to like construct these arcs and try and colonize Mars So the basic premise of the game is you're still on Earth and you're the younger of these two sisters that are both astronauts and their father is one of the ones that sort of, he's like the main uh, like brains behind creating these arcs and creating this like new sustainable kind of environment and a lot of, he's kind of perceived as a villain by a lot of the people in the community and he's kind of off on, on Mars now like colonizing it and it's such a cool dynamic because the older sister is she's a little bit more, she had to be like the caregiver for you because the dad like abandoned them. And she has like a very like sour relationship with their dad and she kind of sees him as a villain. But you as, you play as the younger sister and she has like a more like idolized look at their father and she's much more sympathetic to him. And that sort of dichotomy between the, su- the two sisters is like always at play throughout the story. And I, I just love like science fiction stories that sort of marry like high concept sci-fi with like really deep human relationships uh it made me think a lot about like interstellar the movie kind of does that a little bit and also if you've ever read like carl sagan's contact 
It kind of does that a lot really I well. I haven't read it, but I've seen the movie. Yeah, that one. <laughs> another great Jodie Foster. And Matt, PRH author Matthew McConaughey, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I just I just love those, like, when those when you can kind of combine, like, the cosmic with, like, the really deeply human. I think that's always, like, a really cool uh, dichotomy. And it even has, like, a little bit of, like, a heart of darkness quality to it where you have this, like, figure, right, this father that you're sort of pursuing. And as you're getting closer and closer to finding them, you're, you're discovering more about, like, what makes them tick and what their motivations are. So it has that sort of, like, Mr. Kurtz, Colonel Kurtz, if, like, if Apocalypse Now is more your thing, that kind of, like, element to it, which I think you is know, really the cool. the choice between Apocalypse Now yeah. or Heart of Darkness. Yeah. <laughs> Both very interesting. You know, I, I found out that Joseph Conrad actually, like, didn't like Heart of Darkness at all. He, like, thought it was, like, trash. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Well, he was trash, so. Oh, was he? I'm pretty sure. Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we definitely had a great time with games in 2023, but what are some games coming out in this next year that you're excited for? Well, I feel like a broken record, but it needs to be said. <laughs> my my hype level for Final Fantasy Rebirth, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is like it's actually getting to the point where it's not it's not good. I'm a little bit concerned because I think there's no way that this game can like meet my expectations because I'm getting so excited for it. So I'm trying to like calm myself down. Uh but yeah, I mean, they just keep releasing more and more and it just seems like it's going to be like such an insanely like big game. And I don't know, have you played uh Remake? No, I've only played the original seven. Uh, but did you, do you like the original one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I for me, like, the original one, that's, like, one of those, like, milestone games for me. <laughs> it, like, hit me right in my, like, formative years. I think I first played it when I was, like, a freshman in high school. So it was, like, yeah, that one hit me hard. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm, like, obsessed with Final Fantasy VII. Like, if you look at my old Trapper Keepers from high school, it's just, like, doodles of, like, Cloud and Sephiroth everywhere. Um <laughs> But yeah, um, yeah, I just thought they did such a good job with remake in like ex expanding like Midgar because you probably know the first game's all in Midgar, and you know you know it's like a pretty small slice of the overall game. But I thought like they did such a great job of adding more characters, exploring characters you already know in much more detail, and really just making it feel like a much more like vibrant, real city. And you know that was a little bit more manageable with the first game because you were contained in Midgar, but now in this part of the story, you're you're kind of like oh, out in the open world. And I'm very curious to see how they take that approach to like a more open world type of game. Because sometimes it can be tricky when you give people too much freedom to try and like tell a nice, coherent and paced, well-paced story. So I'm very, very curious, but I, I have faith. I think they're gonna do a great job. All right, well, <laughs> I will say one of my games that I'm most excited for this year is actually one that's coming out as of us recording this next week, but as of this going out, probably like in a day. <laughs> uh, so I'm super excited for like a Dragon Infinite mm. Wealth to come out. Like I am love, I mean, I love the Yakuza series. I am, I am a bigger fan of the newer protagonist Ichiban than I was ever of Kiru. Like, I'm kind of sad that this one they're like we've got to bring back Kiru because I I was ready to let him <laughs> retire. But yeah, I'm super excited to also see them take on, you know, kind of moving gameplay from being set in Japan to now it takes place in Hawaii and it's just going to be interesting seeing, you know, a completely new environment and I'm very excited to play that. What type of cuz I know it's like I really want to play Yakuza games or the Like a Dragon games, but it's just they're so daunting to me because like some of them are like really long and yeah, I, I mean, don't know where to begin. I would begin for you like I would begin with Seven, which is the like it's when they introduce it's when they introduce Ichiban as like the new protagonist, and it's completely okay. like there are references you know to the rest of the game, but like it's very standalone, and it's like honestly the best JRPG out there. Like okay. it's also like. A, amazingly well-written story oh nice i'm like i'm excited for you at the prospect that you could play like it for the dragon, first time so? yeah okay so that's not the one that takes place in like feudal japan right that's no so one? that was uh ishin which is like it's kind of its own like little okay, spin-off so i don't need to that's not part of like the lore right no okay yeah because i i started to play 
I think it's called like the man who erased his name. And that's what Kiru, right? Is yes. The main so no? yeah. yeah, that one like you definitely shouldn't play that one. Okay. I only played like the first couple of missions. Yeah, it was really weird because like my friend who is also a super big Yakuza fan, she was like, they keep marketing this as a great place to start the series, but it's not. <laughs> that's probably why. Yeah, I saw it in like an article or something. But yeah, definitely like seven, which is Yakuza seven like a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is the best place nice. I would recommend to so start. So what type of stories are they? Are they like hard boiled like <laughs> mob stories or are they like cuz I always got the feeling they were kind of like lighthearted and kind of quirky, but I don't I don't know. I've never actually played them. So. Uh so I mean they're actually like very like heartfelt oh, and yeah? it's oh, no. like I mean obviously, you know, real life yakuza are not good people, but it's, <laughs> like that's your American slant, Charlotte. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Seven is you know, like so, like Ichiban goes to prison at the very start of it for like a crime he didn't commit, and then you like jump mm. forward in time and he gets out of prison, and there's a lot of you know like kind of solving murder, helping good, yeah. people. There's a lot of, like, it's honestly, like, the most positive depiction of, like, sex work and, like, protecting people who work in, like, the sex work industry yeah. that, like, games have ever done. <laughs> I definitely want to check it out. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I honestly wasn't really feeling uh, The Erased Man. Or I mean, I think it was probably because I was just, like, kind of lost. Um, it also had, like, a little bit of an arcade kind of to the gameplay which I, I didn't love but it let me ask you this is do you remember the game called like i think it was called sleeping dogs where you were like an undercover cop i remember it i didn't like ever actually play it was that at all related to these games because it had a very similar like um like look and play style because it was sort of like a beat-em-up but it had like a very like story yeah and that's plot. also why like i would recommend seven for you because it's a turn-based rpg oh okay and like the whole idea is the whole idea was supposed to be like so like a dragon as a series going forward will be their like turn based JRPG and then Judgment, which is a spin off of oh, yeah. the series, you talked will about be that, their yeah. beat up version, but there are problems. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so, is that gonna take me like eighty hours to beat? Yeah. Oh man. But you'll have I a might good have to squeeze it in. And th that one the new one comes out soon, right? Yeah, the twenty six. Oh wow. <laughs> Man, there's so yeah, this weird man. There's so many good ones like in the first quarter of the year, really, that are coming out. Yeah, I'm the only person excited for Ghost Banishers of New Eden. <laughs> oh yeah, you talked about that. <laughs> well, are you not excited for uh, Persona Three Reload? I mean, okay, like yes, I'm excited. I will play it eventually, but like it is, I have played Persona Three, so it's oh, not quite as a, like I have experienced that story, so it's not quite as like I have to play this instantly, sort of. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm still working my way through Persona Four. Because I, I love Persona 5. That was the first one I played. And, oh man, I, I got pretty pretty far into Persona 4. I think it's it's a little tough to go backwards, though, because even though I really like the story of Persona 4, some of, like, the dungeons and, like, the combat, it feels, like, a little repetitive compared to 5. So that, that was a little bit of a slog. Yeah, but definitely, play, like, power through. I, because I, if I remember correctly, like, Persona 4 Golden has been ported to basically everything. Yeah, that's the one I'm playing. Yeah, because yeah. that's definitely like a big improvement on the gameplay. But yeah, yeah the it story is really cool though. I do love like the the mystery around surrounding it. So yeah, I'm definitely gonna get uh, three when it comes out. Because a lot of people I've known in the community, or I know in the community, they they say like the third one they like the best. Because I think that's when they like made the shift of like whatever. Yeah. Like combining the whole like high school friend simulator with the. RPG elements. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's also, like, something I'm very curious to see how they're going to be handling in this one, because the whole thing with Persona 3 is the original didn't do a great job of letting you social link with your whole team, oh. and then the Persona 3 Portable did, because you could be the female main character, and you could actually, you know, like, social link with all of the male characters on your team as well as the female characters whereas the male protagonist could only do the female characters oh i see mm -hmm. so i'm pretty sure that like they are changing that in this new one oh, nice. so that you can social link everyone but like hopefully they <laughs> yeah, keep from, stuff like from that from what i've read they are overhauling quite a bit like i think they're redoing like the battle system i think it's supposed to really uh emulate a lot of the flair and style of persona 5 
which everyone loved. Rightfully so. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, speaking of Flair, another game that, like, honestly, I haven't been following that closely, but I'm still excited to play is Deca Police, oh. which is a crime suspense RPG that Level 5 is releasing. Oh, is that the Nino Kuni people? Yeah. Oh, nice. But, like, honestly, it's one where just, like, the art style and especially, like, the protagonist design I'm like find really appealing, so I'm like, oh, I want to play that when it comes out. Yeah, what was it called again? Uh, Deca Police. Deca Police, interesting. But yeah, it's also one where it's a little unclear if it's actually coming out this year or next year. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. There's a few games that um, are in that camp that I wasn't sure I wanted to talk about. One game I'm like super excited for. It's uh, it's called Euden Chronicle. A hundred heroes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Bit of a, a mouthful, but yeah, um, this is kind of like a spiritual successor to the Suikoden um, RPGs from the, I guess it started in the PS1 era, then they made a few PS2 version uh, sequels, but um, I love these games because the story is always something around like you trying to build an army and a kingdom to sort of counteract this evil empire <laughs> you love <laughs> a good building so. i do yeah i mean this is one of the first games i remember that had like a mix of it had like traditional turn-based battles but you also um had like really cool base building where you had to like every every character you recruited would add like something to your your headquarters and then it would gradually get bigger and then you would actually fight in these like large-scale like um army battles and um all the characters that you accumulated in the story would like that would affect how you kind of like fight in those battles and then they'd also have like one-on-one -on -one duels which were kind of like they were a little like rock paper scissory but they were still kind of fun um but i think like above all like the storytelling i really like how even though it is there are like fantasy elements and there are supernatural elements it's very like subdued and the the main drivers of the plot is more like geopolitical and a lot of that kind of like government intrigue and they're in like a medieval setting, but you know it, it definitely has that like Game of Thronesy kind of like backstabbing <laughs> sort of storytelling to it. If you've ever played like Final Fantasy Tactics, it's very similar type of storytelling to that, which that's I really like. Actually, the first Final Fantasy I ever played. That's one of my favorites. It's, that's a, I think that's kind of underrated to be honest. Uh, love that well, game. perfect episode to mention it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited for that, and it also has that mix of pixel art and. 3D environments that you that's kind of becoming a little bit more popular now. If you've ever played like Octopath Traveler or Bravely Default, it has that that sort of look to it, which I think is really cool. Bravely Default is one of those games that I've gotten so close to being like, yeah, I should play this before, and then like there's just enough, you know, criticisms where I'm like, do I though? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you might like it because yeah, they, they are they're, those games. I think they probably look better on a Switch, you know, since you like playing on the Switch. Um, it's definitely like a good look for that that console. And yeah, are you at all excited about Star Wars Outlaws? I think that's supposed to come out this year. Right? I I am excited. In I guess like excited isn't the right term. Like mm -hmm. I am intrigued because it looks interesting. I will probably play it, but I guess also there's just so little info, and I guess it's so abstract when it will actually even come out that it's yeah. hard to you know kind of like latch on <laughs> yeah i think the last thing i saw there at least as of now they're planning for later in the year of this year they're um, gonna announce like on monday that it's been canceled forever yeah, probably <laughs> um hopefully not but yeah i just like the idea of delving more deep into the i guess like the underworld of the star wars universe <laughs> and because i think one of the cool things i like about star wars stories is like all the different aliens and all the different like quirky personalities and i, I think it's fun when yeah. you like have like a more gang based I guess type of plot and also like I I'm pretty sure I've said this before in some form I think Star Wars works best when like there are self-contained stories that aren't you know all connected like yeah, it makes yeah. the galaxy feel small when it's like and everyone knows everyone like, oh there's Han Solo at the bar <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I mean they did a release a pretty substantial chunk of gameplay. I don't know if you saw that. It looked pretty cool. It's very much kind of looked like Uncharted in terms of like the gunplay uh, and a lot of like sneaking around. I think you have some kind of like, I don't think it's a robot. I think you have like an alien kind of companion that looked kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that. And yeah. 
Are there any upcoming books that you're excited for? There actually are. There's quite a few. But one that I am very intrigued by is um, there's a book coming out um, by Gabriel, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And um, it's actually a book that is the last book that he wrote, but it, was, it hadn't been published. He's actually, he's passed away now. Um, I think it's been about 10 years since he's passed away, but I'll have a little text thing to confirm exactly when that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's called uh, Until August, and it's it's sort of like about this this woman and like every August she's like married and I think she has kids and the premise is that like every August she goes to this like resort and has like takes on a new lover um, and it's something that she does like every year it's like a, like a, an annual thing and I think it really like explores those like ideas of like you know keeping like your sexual desires and your like a double life kind of, yeah that kind of like having them like both in parallel but in like maybe like a healthy way I don't know or just exploring like those those possibilities but yeah I think what's in, what's intriguing about the whole thing though is that you know he obviously like finished the book quite a while ago but he, he didn't want it to be published so this is always like kind of like an interesting little debate yeah. when you have like an author that specifically st- says they don't want something published and you're and like oh controversy anyway. I need to look at it <laughs> I mean I, I find it very fascinating because at least in this case it was his uh, sons that decided to uh, release it so Those gonna, gosh darn children. Yeah. And, you know, part of the reason why he didn't want to release it is because he actually, like, late in his life, he actually suffered with dementia. And he thought that it, like, affected his writing negatively. But, you know, his son, they said, like, for whatever reason, they, they think, like, the world deserves to see it. I'm curious, like, it is an interesting debate. What do, you, do you have, like, thoughts on that and, like, whether or not those types of things should be published? Uh, yeah. I mean, I feel like it kind of slides back and forth. Mm. Like, on one hand, I, you know, as a fan of people, I'm like, oh, if they made work, I want to see it. But on the other hand, it's like, but if it's not work that they wanted to put out there, then shouldn't you respect those wishes? Yeah. I believe uh, Kafka, all of Kafka's work, he didn't want published. And what was, was it his friend or was it like his an accountant or somebody? It wasn't a family member. I think it was like a close friend that was the one that decided to like, oh, this stuff is too good. Like people have to see this. That's like there are some J.D. Salinger short stories that, mm. you know, are like unreleased and you uh, can yeah. only go read them at like a specific, I think it's some university library. Mm. And I was like, I want the secret J.D. Salinger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there any uh, books that you're excited about? Yes, and I brought a pro. Oh. So this is the book that I'm most excited to read, and it we just recently got physical copies of it, which is why I am now really excited to read it. It is by Philip B. Williams, and it is called Ours, and it just sounds like such an amazing narrative. It's kind of, you know, a magical realism fantasy take on, you know the slavery era of the South. It's about a conjurer who kind of annihilates plantations across Arkansas to release the people enslaved there. And she creates kind of a safe haven for them to live in. And it just kind of explores, you know, that community and exploring that kind of alternate history of what this could be. And Philip B. Williams was, has been primarily a poet, so, I'm just really excited to delve into, you know, kind of experiencing his transition from poetry to prose. Ah. And I feel like that's always a really cool thing to watch an author go through that journey. Yeah. It sort of reminds me a little bit about uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Water Dancer. That's exactly what I said uh, yeah. when I first heard Because, <laughs> yeah, I guess it was a little different for him because he was jumping from, like, journalism and nonfiction to fiction. But, yeah, that whole idea of that era and that point in American history and like putting like magical realism elements. And I think he was very inspired by like comic books too. Yeah, it definitely, you know, kind of makes you think of like Black Panther, that sort Mm, of. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he worked on, uh, oh man, I'm forgetting. I think he worked on this, I I don't know. I'll have to look it up. But he definitely either worked on like a comic book, more recent comic books, or it might even been like aspects of the movie that came out, I forget. Um, Yeah, and this one is definitely like, it's a big novel, yeah. so I will be reading it for a while. And like I see, there's a blurb mentioning that it's like Gabriel Garcia Marquez's <laughs> Hundred Years of Solitude. So look it's at that. all coming together. <laughs> it's 
Sweet. Um, another book that I'm I'm very excited about is um, Sylvia Morena Garcia has another book coming out this she year. She writes called, so much. I know. I'm kind of jealous. It's crazy, but uh, it's called The Seventh Veil of Salome, and her last book, Silver Nitrate, um, it was sort of told in the backdrop of the Mexican film industry, which I really am interested in. Anything like dealing with like behind the scenes film stuff, I'm always interested in. Um, but yeah, this one kind of keeps that one going. This one's more about like 1950s Hollywood and it's about a Mexican act- actress who takes on the role of uh, like a Hollywood production of Salome. And I'm not sure, most of our books, they usually have some kind of supernatural horror element to it. I don't know if this one does, so I'm interested to see. I, it probably does. Um, but yeah, I'm very uh, excited to, to check that one out because I, I like the way that she she mixes those sort of uh, historical elements with like a like kind of like a, a fun sort of take on horror that I like. Yeah, I think it'll be fun to see because right now there are not a lot of games with official release dates like April onwards for this yeah, year. Yeah. So we should have more time for reading. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So those are things in 2023 we thought were underrated and things in 2024 that we are looking forward to. We would love to hear from you guys what you thought deserved more love in 2023 and what you're excited for coming up. Yes. And weigh in on the should should a book be published if the author doesn't want it published. No. Um, But yeah, if you like this video, please uh, like and subscribe because it does help with the algorithm. Um, But yeah, we hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time. (laughs) Ha <laughs> ha.